Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about the first serious contenders for reusable rockets. Back in 1993, a company was founded by a guy called Walter Kistler. He'd had a long history in the space program, having designed critical instrumentation for early spacecraft such as the Agena Upper Stage. The Kistler team was actually full of a whole bunch of Apollo veterans, including George Miller, who's sometimes referred to as the father of the space shuttle. But their plan was to build a reusable launch vehicle. It was the Kistler K-1. And in 2006, it was one of two companies awarded a NASA contract to develop orbital transportation services. The other was a little-known company called Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX for short. Now, at this point, SpaceX was still trying and failing to launch the Falcon 1, but it had announced plans for the Falcon 9, and it would be five years before SpaceX announced their plans for reusable rockets. The Kistler team, on the other hand, had spent 10 years designing their reusable rocket, the K-1. However, without any revenue, they'd actually run out of money and declared bankruptcy in 2005. But in 2006, they would merge with the suborbital startup Rocketplane Inc. to form Rocketplane Kistler. This new lease of life let them compete for the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program, and they won a $200 million contract. And with that infusion of cash from NASA, they began signing contracts to build and test their vision of the future. The K-1 launch vehicle was a two-stage, fully reusable rocket. The overall mass was about uh, 380 tons, and it would be about 37 meters long. The first stage was called the Launch Assist Platform. It was 18 meters long, 6.7 meters in diameter, and it would be about 250 tons when fully fueled at launch. The second stage was uh, about the same length. It was actually slightly longer, 18.6 meters, and uh, but it was a whole lot narrower. It weighed 130 tons fully fueled. Now, uh, the first stage used three liquid oxygen kerosene engines, and the second stage would use a single engine. All of these main engines were derived from the NK-33 engines. The NK-33 engines, if you remember, were originally developed for the Soviet N-1 moon rocket. And uh, yes, while the moon rocket was not the most successful, the engines on paper were the best engines in the world with really high specific impulse and really amazing thrust to weight ratio. And it was only because it was politically inconvenient that they'd never really flown. They'd ended up getting stuck in a warehouse for 30 years until the end of the Cold War when when uh, Russia was looking around to sell things. They said, hey, we've got these really, really good engines. So Aerojet, of course, took these engines. They modernized them. They added new electronics, new hydraulic gimballing capabilities. And uh, these were then sold as Aerojet jet engines such as the AJ26 series. So the launch profile would have the first stage rocketing up to about 43 kilometers at a velocity of 1.2 kilometers per second where stage separation would happen. The second stage would of course continue on towards orbit but the launch assist platform, the first stage, would then flip around and reignite its engine to head back to the launch site. Now, to land, it wouldn't use rockets like the SpaceX Falcon 9s. Instead, they envisaged using parachutes and airbags to absorb the landing force. And they figured that they could have a quick turnaround if they could land these things. The second stage, well, uh, the second stage would continue to orbit on the main power. Again, this would be a kerosene liquid oxygen engine. But once it got to orbit, it would use a different orbital maneuvering system that would be fueled by liquid oxygen and ethanol. Now, the front of the orbital vehicle would be a big payload door, which would open up and deploy the payload, after which it would close because this would function as the heat shield for re-entry. Now, after being on orbit for 24 hours, of course, the Earth would have rotated all the way around. It would perform its re-entry burn and return towards the launch site and again land with the assistance of parachutes and airbags. 
So it was a really well developed concept. There are other concepts that they tested or uh, made animations for. There's one that I like, which looks like a, it's a kind of like a rocket powered quadcopter. It's very Kerbal, but presumably they switched to a more traditional design because they figured that NASA would be more conservative. Anyway, the reason why this isn't flying is because Kistler just couldn't get the money they needed. They couldn't get the investment they wanted. Part of the commercial, part of their $200 million contract required that they get a certain amount of private investment. And I'm sure SpaceX handled that just fine because, of course, they had Elon Musk running around with lots of money. But by this point, uh, Kistler could not find the funding they needed. And after several warnings and several extensions, the contract was cancelled after they only made about $30 million. At this point, the money then went back up for grabs. And we all know that it went to another group called Orbital Sciences, who would eventually develop their launch vehicle in the form of the Antares. The Antares, I'm sure you remember, was the one that exploded about thirty, about eight seconds after launch, and it too was using these NK-33 engines. Now, the other side of rocket plane Kistler is, of course, rocket plane, and uh, they were originally founded in 2004 they wanted to do something like uh, Spaceship One. Their their vision is basically a, a Learjet with a rocket engine strapped to it. They wanted to take paying customers up to 100 kilometers so they could see the curvature of the Earth and experience zero G. They uh, they pitched this for a while. They have also pitched the uh, a version of the XS launcher, the ability to launch small satellites from a space plane. But yeah, they also have you know, collapsed under various financial troubles and their assets have been sold. Both companies still kind of exist on paper with uh, the rights to the technology, but I don't think anything is seriously happening with either of them at this point. And then, of course, there is that problem of the Kistler K-1 being po uh, powered by engines whose reputation has been tarnished due to a slight uh, rapid unplanned disassembly. Regardless, this is an interesting path not taken. Sometimes I wonder how the commercial space transportation field would uh, be different if Kistler had managed to get the money for their launch vehicle. Would SpaceX have been able to compete? Who knows? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.